in the fourth chapter of Judges, there is a woman described uh, as a prophet, a woman who is described that generals uh, considered her to be a strength in battle, but also a prophet and a judge. She carried authority. Her name was Deborah. And there's a woman named Christine Kane, who I would say is a modern day Deborah right now. How many of y'all know who Christine Kane is? Okay, there is so many amazing uh, female uh, communicators that are the Deborahs of our generation and upcoming Deborahs of our generation. And we have someone on our team uh, that I get to hang out and do life with every day who is a Deborah on our team, and her name is Jackie Groves. So will y'all just welcome Jackie as she brings the word today. Let's go. All right. All right. Let's go. Y'all, I am humbled and honored to be called a Deborah. Deborah was a woman that wasn't messing around. Amen. That is a woman I am, I am proud to just try to follow in her footsteps. But y'all, we are going to have a good message today. Amen. I'm excited. Now I am Y'all know I'm excitable. I get excitable. I get really excited. I I raise my voice. I whisper sometimes. I stomp my feet. I'll do it all, okay? Because I'm excited about the Word of God. God is so, so good. So can we just jump right on in? Will y'all go with me? All right, all right. So today, I believe that God has an incredible incredible word for y'all. I had plans to preach an entirely different message today, but I shared this in my Bible study earlier this week, and I felt I felt the Lord nudge me a little bit to just take this message and go a little bit deeper with y'all today. And it's exciting because we are in a brand new series, Beyond the Blessing. Amen? Amen. It's good. It's good. How many of you know that blessings, we like a good blessing, right? How many of you would agree that feeling blessed and taken care of is a good thing? There shouldn't be too much disagreement on that. It is a good thing, living in the favor of God, understanding the goodness of God. It's honestly pretty indescribable. When you talk about the goodness of God, you kind of get stuck at the the good part. You're like, it's it's good. The goodness of God is just, it's good. It's hard to describe because God is just so, so very good. But how many of you also know that there is a rhythm to receiving the blessings of God? There's a rhythm in there. There is more benefit in this relationship that we have the opportunity to have with the creator of heaven and earth than there is the benefit of getting the, you know, the fun things, the little things that we have on wish lists. Pastor Daniel teases about the Escalades and you know he's a sneaker guy. We've all got these things that we like and that we want, but there is so much more benefit in relationship. Our children would absolutely attest to the fact that they might want all the toys They might want all the games. They might want all the fun stuff. But really, at the end of the day, it's the relationship that they have with us as their parents, the time that we invest, the care that we take, the things that we affirm in their hearts and encourage in them. Those are the things that are just simply better. And sometimes the greatest part of the blessing in life is knowing that God just knows what's even better even better than what you're like, Lord, just please, like this is in my heart. This is the thing that I need from you. He's like, okay, I'll, I'll do one better, all right? And I know how to get it to you. So just, give, just, let me, just let me give you the good thing. Go with me, okay? And this is what God is constantly asking of us. So we're gonna talk about it today. But before we do that, this is our last Sunday of Black History Month, and it has been an incredible time. Yes, you can celebrate. All month long, Pastor Daniel has made time to celebrate the life and legacy of an influential visioneer that has paved the way with courage, identity, and tenacity in their field and their sphere of influence. Each one of these specific individuals, and yes, there are innumerable more than what we have mentioned, has specifically left a mark on our culture and our society, and for that, we're grateful. So today we are highlighting Thomas Andrew Dorsey. How many of you know who Thomas Andrew Dorsey is? All right, well, you're welcome, okay? Because Dorsey, in his lifetime, left a massive mark on the church and the secular world as well as an American musician, composer, and Christian evangelist. He is best known for the influential role he played in the early development of one of my personal genres of music, and that is gospel. He was known as the father of gospel music, all right? You can give a big amen to that one. 
During his lifetime from 1899 to 1993, he wrote over 3,000 songs, y'all. 3,000, okay? Think about writing like five or six. Takes a little bit of time. He wrote 3,000 in his lifetime. That's a big, big mark. He determined also that the only real difference between blues and church music was the lyrics. He was a music director in, in Chicago for 50 years where he introduced, get this, he introduced clapping and shouting and stomping into worship. Come on, come on, I'm grateful for that all by itself. He changed the face of music, but also the freedoms available to us as believers in worship. Can you join me as we honor the life and the legacy of Thomas Andrew Dorsey? Yeah, awesome. So how many of you know that God is really good at using the season of life that we're in, the thing that has the most of our attention, the thing that we are the most focused on to teach us some of the greatest lessons in our lives? How many of you know that he likes to do that if we're paying attention, if we are aware of it? And as most of you know, Pastor Daniel and I, we have four wonderful kiddos. One of our beautiful little ones is right here in the front row. Finny Lou, stand up and wave at everybody. She's just so cute. This is my Finny. Her name is Finley. We have lots of nicknames for our children. So her middle name's not Lou. I just, I just call them all sorts of things, but they, they know who I'm talking to. It's important. So in this season of parenting, we have at our oldest is a 13-year-old boy and our youngest is a three-year-old boy as well with two beautiful little girls there in the middle. So I'm definitely in the thick of it as a mother, right? I got a teenager all the way down to a toddler. So needless to say, God takes this position of parenting that I am in, and while he pours instruction and encouragement through me to my kiddos, how many of you know that he takes instruction and encouragement and pours it through me to me? How many of you know that it is in these moments a lot of the time where I'm like, oh, I'm gonna say this because this is what God wants you to hear. And I say it and I'm like, okay. You just, you just, Lord, you just wanted me to hear that. But I'll pretend like that was for somebody else. I'll pretend like that was for my kids, but really that was for me. So that is the goodness of God. So a perfect example of this is our little fox, the three-year-old. I say three, he's not quite three yet, but he's a big boy, so he's, he's kind of like a three-year-old. He's the perfect example because if you were ever to define a mama's boy, that is my fox. His name is Foster Dean. It's a strong name and we call him Fox, but that's okay too. But he is a mama's boy. And when I say this, I say this with only love, only love. And it is a wonderful, wonderful thing for me. Now, once he hits 18, it won't be as positive any longer. Okay. That's all right. If you're sitting next to a mama's boy, don't raise your hand because at some point he's got to grow out of it. But right now, it's precious. There is nothing in this boy's life that mama can't do, that mama shouldn't be doing for him. There is nothing that comes from anyone else in the world that's good. It all has to come from mom. If he's hungry, mom's gotta be the one that gets it. If he's thirsty, mom's gotta be the one that gets it. If he gets in his car seat, mom's gotta be the one that buckles him in. If he needs something in particular to go potty, anything, it, that has to come from mama. When his daddy says, you daddy's boy, he said, no, me a mama's boy. So sweet. Good parenting would be to say, don't say no to your father. But I, at this point, I'm like, yes, you are. You're a mama's boy. And I just love it. So he's my guy, y'all. He's my guy. Now I have an older one, but he's 13. So I can't describe him as a mama's boy from the platform. And it would break his heart, humiliate him beyond recognition. However, my three-year-old, we'll stick with him. He's my guy until this one particular moment and all of it comes into question. And that moment is when I try to put him in the shower, okay? If I try to put my little Foxy in the shower at all, he quickly becomes very uncertain, very uncertain that I can be trusted at all. And he, he panics so, so fast. Now, let me tell you this, the shower, before we get any emails asking why I'm not bathing my three-year-old in the bathtub, I'm bathing him as well, but there are moments where a child just needs a good rinse off, right? Amen? Thank you for clapping on that one. Don't get me wrong, I bathe them, okay? But y'all, kids are wonderful and can be super gross, okay? 
super gross. I mean, real gross. And maybe you're a bathtub person and you're offended by this whole thing that's between you and the Lord. But for my kiddos, okay, I need all that stuff that they have just been enjoying throughout the day to rinse off instead of them to sit in it. Can I get an amen? amen. Yuck. Okay. With kids, all right, there's just a different level of cleansing that's needed. So my sweet little Foxy, he loses all memory of my track record as his mama, okay? He loses all of it. He forgets that I'm a safe place, that I'm his protector, that he can trust me, okay? And he goes into full-on toddler panic mode. That boy stands in the corner of that shower and acts as if that is molten lava flowing from the ceiling. And it, he just has no idea. He is completely under the impression that he is being attacked, like full on attack by water. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but that's where he is. That's where he is in life. If you picture a cat in the shower, that's my little foxy. Okay. That's the full picture. It's a full picture of where he is and what he's dealing with. He is similar in the bathtub, okay? But somehow with the bathtub, he gets the idea that the water rises and then he climbs in. He gets that concept. Um, but I think the problem is that he has come to know the cleaning process as one thing. Water rises, I get in. So he can't process the idea that this might look way different, but still have the same function. Anybody ever been there before? Anybody ever been in a spot where you thought something very different was coming? And then you found yourself in the middle of a downpour that you just did not expect. Every time I have to stop with my Foxy and I have to get down and I have to say, buddy, buddy, it's me, it's mama. Trust me, trust me. I was reminded of this this last week in our staff rally. So I was talking with our team about how we're in this season um, as a church, but it's not an isolated season to our church. It's not an isolated season to regions for those that are watching online. It's, it's not even isolated to specifically this season of life because I guarantee you, you've probably seen this before if you've had any experience in life at all where we are fine with being on a journey we really thought it would look a little different. And in certain seasons, we come to this place in our relationship with God where we can't exactly see what on earth that is that's coming down or why it looks like it does or who's the one that's delivering this. God, where are you? Where we find ourselves in these seasons and we're asking all kinds of questions because this moment of confusion on our end leads us to that. For, makes us forget about the track record of God, just like my Foxy forgets about my track record as his mama. We tend to do that. And then where we find ourselves is we in this position, we insist, insist that God must explain himself immediately. Explain yourself, God. God, you said, you said, you said that I would get this. You said I would be there. You said I would do the other thing. I sound kind of like a toddler pitching a tantrum, right? We don't like to be referred as adults to childlike behaviors, do we? But how many of you could maybe look back on a moment where you said, but God, why didn't this happen when I said that it, I thought it should? Or when you told me about your promises, I mean, he's, Pastor Daniel says there's no expiration date on your promises, but I thought I would have it by next Tuesday. So how come? And then we position ourselves as if we think that God has to answer to us, right? Like, I've got all these questions, God. You need to answer them. You need to, you need to provide me with some answers right now, Lord. That's really kind of out of order, right? Because you know what God's response is in those moments? It's the same one I had with Fox. It's, hey, hey, buddy, hey, daughter, hey, son. It's still me. I'm still God. Still the same God I've always been. Trust me. Sometimes God billows really loud and he answers to us and we feel like, whoa, God just spoke to me. And other times God whispers and he says, hey, come on now. You're my kid. You know me. You know my nature. Trust me. But I do believe that that might be one of the hardest requests he makes of us. One of the hardest requests is to not be in control, right? 
Anybody want to admit that out in the open air? One of the hardest things to not be is in control. And in these moments where God says, just trust me, I mean, that comes with an unspoken understanding that God isn't really saying, but that he's hoping that we get in that moment. And that is that it's just not trusting him if we have to ask him to prove himself over and over and over again before we will follow him. That's not trust, y'all. That's not what trust looks like. The beyond the blessing moments happen in our lives when we understand that our trust has to meet up with our obedience. They make the most beautiful relationship, but they have to work together in conjunction. Because here's the simplicity of it, and if you've been in a relationship, you will understand this, but our heart has to be demonstrated in our actions. It's not enough just to say, I trust you. It's not enough just to say, God, I trust you, but I think I have a better idea. God, I trust you. You're a really great God. You are the God of the heavens and the earth. I trust you. But I mean, maybe you could just let me know so I could decide if I'm okay with that. You think you could do that? That's not trusting. That is not what it looks like. We have to let our actions demonstrate the heart that we have of trust. Then we have to follow. We have to choose to obey even when we don't know the details of his plan. Baby, would you come up here for me real quick? Y'all, would you welcome Pastor Daniel to the stage again really fast? Oh, you can do better than that. Come on, there's my guy. There we go. There we go. He's my best visual illustration, but he's also perfect in this moment because he's really tall. So... Here I am behind him, and for the most part, those of you sitting in here, aside from my fingers and maybe some of my orange hair, just can't really see me behind him. Those of you watching online can't see me behind him because I am technically positioned to follow his lead. I am following behind him as he leads, and that's what this looks like. As I follow along behind him, do you know what I can't see? I can't see in front of him. I can't see the route in front of him. I can't see a clear illustration of where he's going because that's what following looks like. So when you are not the one leading and you are the one that is following and step behind, sometimes it's kind of hard, y'all. Like, I can't step on his shoes. And if I don't know which way he's going, I've got to to take smaller steps. Don't worry, (laughs) cardinal sin. I, I... I don't know. It's a little more difficult. It's a little more difficult than that. Gosh, I'd just rather know what's in, what's in front. But you know what position he has when he's leading? He gets to field anything that comes at us. And I get to stay hidden behind him because he's leading and I am following. And the beauty of following behind God and following his lead is the understanding that no, you don't have a clear path to visually see what's in front. You're not supposed to, because that's the person leading's role. Amen? Thank you, darling. The role of God as our leader, when we follow the lead of God, we're not supposed to see it all, y'all. You're not supposed to see a clear route in front of you. God has that view, and that is what trust really is defined as, is the understanding that God is the one navigating the course. There might be a point in your journey where you feel like God takes a hard swipe to the left. He swerves out of the way, and you're thinking, why did we go left? We were going straight, God but you didn't see what he swerved to keep you from running right into. You didn't see what he protected you from because you're not supposed to see it. It is for the one leading you. So in that understanding, we have to be able to say, so if I'm following you, God, I don't have to see it all. Not supposed to see it all because then I'm just a backseat driver to your lead. Because then I'm just sitting there saying the whole time, well, clue me in, God. Clue me in on your godness. Like, show me, show me, like, in my small-mindedness what I'm supposed to know. You're not! You're just supposed to know what the leader tells you as you follow. The thing about our God and all his wisdom is he isn't often asking us just to trust him in the simple moments. Simple moments are the, my fox saying, I'm hungry. Okay, I'll feed you. I'm thirsty. Okay, I'll give you a drink. I have to go potty. Okay, I'll take you to the potty. 
We're going to go someplace. Okay, I'll strap you into the seat. Those are the simple moments. Those are the moments where God, he just, he just proves himself to be good on a regular basis. That's the simple stuff. That is the everyday stuff. But it's in the bigger stuff that God is really wanting you to follow like I was just talking about, where when he says, jump in that shower, I don't mean wait for the temperature to be exactly like you want it to be. Wait to see if your towel is hung exactly in the place you want it to be. Wait to make sure the vent is turned on perfectly. I want you to jump in there. I want you all the way in because I don't want you to have to be worried about what I'm gonna do next. I wanna just be able to move you to wherever it is that I have for you. Whether it is for protection, whether it is for blessing, whether it is for wisdom, no matter what God's reason is, he has a reason and that is why we follow because he has a plan. It's as silly for me to say, without ever looking at the weather tomorrow, it's as silly for me to say, well, I mean, tomorrow, I'm going to wear a tank top and a pair of shorts and it's going to be a delightful day. And y'all are going to be like, well, did you, like, did you check the weather before you made a plan? And if I just said, well, no, I just made a plan because I, I liked the idea. Like, I thought it seemed like a great idea. It's the same silliness as when we say, I'm going to make a plan about something that I have no clue about. And I am going to continue on that route flying blind without the understanding. God is asking us to trust him. There's a particular passage of scripture that I want us to look at today, and it is in 1 Kings 17. Now, 1 Kings may not be some place that y'all read in every single day. It's okay if you admit it, but it's actually a really great uh, passage because it paints an incredible picture of how trust meets with obedience. So first off, a little bit of history for you. First Kings is a book of historical biblical events. So to catch you up, the time period that we're going to hop in here on is when King David had just passed away. So King David was referred to in the Bible by God as a man after God's own heart. So he led as a king and as a ruler with God's heart in mind, with God's principles in mind, following God's ways, listening to the heart of God. He wasn't perfect. But God would still describe him as a man after his own heart. Once he passed away, his son Solomon became king. And for a period of time, he led the same way. But towards the end of his life, he got lost on his journey and he turned away from God. And almost every leader and ruler that followed here in First and Second Kings, and First and Second Kings covers a period of about 400 years. So for a while there, a lot of kings and a lot of rulers led the way Solomon did not like David, not following the heart of God, following and, and looking at things that were not God's plan. So God sent Elijah to tell and to show them that he was the one true God and that there was blessing in following after him. So while Elijah was delivering the message all across the land, just one man delivering this message that God was not pleased with these kings and these leaders and that he was the strong God, that he was also wanting Elijah to tell them that there would be a time of great drought and famine. And God asked him to stop in these certain places to get, because in a drought and a famine, that means no water, no food, right? So God asked him to stop in these certain places and he would have food provided for him. One of them was from a woman at the gate of a city named Zarephath. Say Zarephath three times. <laughs> Guys are really good. I don't think I could have done that. I'm impressed. So we're going to start in verse 8, chapter 17, verse 8. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to him. That was Elijah. Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, and bring me please a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and a little dark here and die, okay? 
This was a serious moment. So a little back history on this widow. She's a widow. Her husband has died. She's in the middle of a drought and a famine. She has no food, no water whatsoever. She has no way to get out of the situation that she is in. If there is a hurricane coming towards our wonderful city, we can just go to another city, hang out till the storm passes, right? If we lose power in our home, we can always go to a hotel or go stay at a friend's house. If there's something happening in our state, we could always drive, fly, go to another state. She didn't have that option. She had no place to go. She had no way to provide anything else. Even though she was a widow, there was nobody else taking care of her. It was just her and her son. They were to the point of starvation that she had planned out their last meal. She said that, that there was, she had a cup full, a little handful of flour and a little bit of oil. So the type of bread that she was gonna be making is what you've probably heard of. It's called unleavened bread. For us, we put all kinds of stuff in our bread, but this type of bread you could make with just flour and oil. So what she probably had to understand when she said a little handful, she probably had about a quarter cup of flour, maybe a little teaspoon of oil. So she's planned all this out. She saved the, the bare minimum she has left to make what that amount would probably make would be just one small little piece of bread, just for the two of them. Not enough to save them, just enough to grace them. And then they didn't have anything left. They would starve to death. She was hopeless. She was in a place of absolute des desperation. So tell me this, if God sent Elijah to her, in all of this land, okay? The woman described in the Bible, in this passage, in Kings, at the beginning of the book, you'll see all the names of these great leaders, great kings. They weren't great in the eyes of God, but they had a lot of authority. And listed amongst all of them is a widow. She didn't even have a name given to her in the text. But why did God send Elijah to her to take her very last meal? Why would God do that? That sounds a little harsh, right? Doesn't seem especially fair. Let's pick up in verse 13 here. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. So she went away and did as Elijah had told her. First off, one thing that's really important to note here is a lot of the time when people are talking about the widow here and Elijah, Elijah is not really talked about as much as the widow and the trust that it required from her. But there are two people in this story that had to trust God in very different ways. Elijah also had to trust God. He was asked to enter into a land where there was no food and no water. He had to just follow in that. For starters, he was told that she would be expecting him, right? God told him, I have directed her, okay? Now, let's skip back here real quick to verse 12, where she says, as surely as the Lord your God lives, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. Does that sound like a woman that's like, oh yeah, you're the guy that God told me about. I've got the bread ready, I already made it. Does that sound like it to you all? I hear a little bit of a tone maybe in the way she said that. Y'all husbands, you know what I mean when I say a little bit of a tone? I think there was potentially a little bit of a tone in there that we ladies can take unintentionally. I mean, I think she was more like, as surely as the Lord your God lives. I don't have any bread. Like, I don't have any bread. I'm not quite sure. But Elijah in that moment had to continue to trust because God said that he had directed her. So how many of you know that sometimes God directs us by specifically telling us something to do? Sometimes God directs us by preparing our heart for what is to come. But that was not something that Elijah could see. Elijah had to keep moving forward in obedience, even though her response, maybe it's like a text message and she was extremely kind. I don't think it was. I think her response had a little bit of pushback, right? Seemed like it had a little bit of pushback. But secondly, secondly, he had to have 
so much confidence in what God had asked of him that he would be willing to ask a widow and her child to give up their last meal and feed him. He had to be so confident and so trusting God that he would say, yeah, but I know this is what God has promised, okay? And I just described to you about that little handful of flour, but he's like, here, look, just give me the first part and then you can have what's left over. Like It's like a piece like this, y'all. So in the natural, he's got to have some kind of trust that says, nope, no, this is what God has asked me to do because that is that's a bold kind of confidence, right? And because he continued to be obedient in his trust in God, the widow was able to walk in obedience as well. Y'all get that? Because he was willing to be obedient to what God asked of him. The widow was then able to be obedient to what God asked of her. One act of obedience leads to another act of obedience, y'all. And maybe you're the one on the other side. Amen. You can clap. Maybe you're the one on the other side of that act of obedience, but maybe you're not. Maybe it's your family members. Maybe it's your coworker. Maybe it's someone that you encounter in life never, but it's just somebody that saw your faith and responded to it. Maybe, maybe your act of obedience changes somebody's life because it's connected to the blessing of God for them. Your willingness to trust him, even when you don't understand the whole plan, is attached to the purposes and the faith of somebody that's just watching you. Not in a weird way, but just watching you. Your choice to continue to follow even when you feel hidden just might help uncover somebody's confidence and joy in life. One thing that we have to look at here is that Elijah was on an assignment. He absolutely was. There is no There is no lack of understanding. God directed him specifically. He was on an assignment and it involved his trust in God. But the widow's assignment to live and see the goodness of God for herself and for her son was connected not just to her trust, but it was connected to his trust as well. And when that trust was met with obedience, when they put them together, they were both beyond blessed. They both had more of God's favor than they possibly could have expected. The second half of verse 15 says, so there was food every day following for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. The best part, the greatest blessing It came after the obedience, y'all. That's where the greatest blessing was. And the greatest blessing was not just that they survived, that they lived. They survived a whole famine on a quarter cup of flour and a teaspoon of oil. They survived on the miraculous. That was enough to mark their life for a whole life. And there were a lot of people that did not have that same testimony. Something of incredible value here that we have to always keep in order is that she trusted, she followed, and then God rewarded. Can't get them mixed up, y'all. She trusted, she followed, and then God rewarded. The reward is inside of the trusting. The reward is inside of the trusting. It is not in the knowing. The reward is actually in the not knowing. Do we understand that? The reward is in the very thing that drives us the most crazy. The reward is in the part of our story that we literally go, oh, God, I'm losing sleep over this. I'm having a hard time. I'm stress eating. Like I am overwhelmed because of this one thing. And that is where the reward is, y'all. The reward is inside of the not knowing. But why? That is because it is in that place that God is in charge that he gets to run point, that he gets to feel the nasty stuff for us, that he gets to direct the course of our life, that he gets to bring the revelation and blessing into. Amen? That is where the blessing of God is when we sincerely follow. When we trust, we obey, and when we follow. The blessing is in the obedience to trust even when we don't know it all because God could have just given her what she needed. 
They probably could have lived on not very much. God could have just given her that, but he wanted her to trust him. So how do we grow in trust? I'm gonna give you three points, three things that I want y'all to think about this week. Write them down if you have something there. But these three things I want you to really, really think about throughout your week. And I want you to think about how they apply to you. The first way to grow in trust is we have to trust God with what remains. Trust God with what remains. She had a quarter of a cup of flour in her hand. We're not talking about bags and bags and bags and bags of flour, but how many of you know that too often we say, ah, I don't have flour to feed the community, so it's not enough. This is not significant because it's small. They've got more, so theirs is more significant. Maybe you are left after a season of hurt with something that feels insignificant, but that is the place where God finds the miraculous because it's in that moment where God can move on the tiniest little thing. We have to trust God with what remains. 2 Corinthians 9, 10 says, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Number two, second thing I want y'all to think on, don't offer your obedience with contingencies. So how many of you have ever bought a house, looked at a house, sold a house that was for sale upon contingencies? Upon sale of another home. You can buy this house only if the other one sells. How many of you know that too often we say in our minds, God, I'll follow you if. I'll do that for you when. After I get my degree, after somebody else tells me, not just you, God, but after somebody else tells me that I'm good at this. After I have enough confirmation that this isn't silly. I'll do that when. I'll do that if. Obedience does not come with contingencies. God never, ever, ever said, perfect yourself on your own and then come to me and I'll do something great. God never said that. He said, bring to me what you are. Bring to me the things that are weak and that are difficult and that you struggle with. Let me fix them. Let me perfect them. Let me use those for my glory. Jeremiah 17, seven and eight says, but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. And number three, be willing to change your plan. Be willing to recognize that maybe that plan that you made, maybe God might not have the same plan. Your heart might line up with his word, but your plan probably doesn't, probably doesn't. Plans are great, I'm a planner. How many planners do we have in here? How many of y'all like those checklists? How many of you like pen and paper? You like to write it down, scratch it off. Yes, amen, yes and amen. I'm not saying that's bad, that's your personality, that's how God has designed you. But when it comes to following after God, let him write that checklist and then you check it off with obedience as you go through saying, I did what you asked God, not define my own list. That is the sweet spot with God. Psalm 143 verse eight says, let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. The story of this widow is so powerful because God could have just sent someone to bring the widow food and water. That's what he instructs of us, right? He instructs us in his word to take care of the widow. He could have just sent somebody else to take care of her, but that's not what he did. He could have provided miraculous manna for her to eat, just miraculously, but he didn't do that either. He asked her to give what she had so that he could provide the rest, so that he could show her how much he loved her, but how strong he was and how he could do anything. So trusting him, it's not a scary thing. Believing that he is bigger, it's not as scary as it seems because God is good and he has beyond great blessings for us. Would y'all bow your head, close your eyes. I wanna pray for you today. And I wanna pray for those that have found themselves in a spot where maybe you have heard God say, hey, my child, my daughter, my son, it's me. I'm here, trust me. And maybe you have disregarded him 
Maybe it's been a struggle. Maybe you couldn't see the blessings around the corner because you just didn't feel worthy or valuable enough. Maybe you can relate to the story of the widow because you found yourself in a hopeless, desperate spot. Maybe you're watching online and you would say, trusting God is not something I'm okay with because I've been through so much. But I want to remind you today, I want to remind you today that none of us ever earned the love and the goodness of God. It's a free gift from a loving father that knows exactly where you are, exactly what you have had a hard time with, exactly what areas you have a hard time giving up control in. He knows all of it. And I wanna pray for you. Lord, I thank you right now for every single person that's hearing my voice today, God. I thank you that you are flooding them with peace right where they are. Not condemnation, but conviction that you are a good, good father and you have good, good things for them and that your way is better and that you're not done, Lord. I thank you, Father, that you will remind them that trusting you, not, not people specifically, but trusting you is the freest place we can ever find ourselves. It actually feels the safest. And I pray right now for every single person that has a little spot in their heart that struggles with trusting, which is really all of us. Pray that you would flood them with peace and joy in knowing that you have a great plan and that you are at work. We thank you, Father. We give you all the praise and all the honor in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen, amen. <laughs>